Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a beautiful day, sunny day here in Kelowna, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this land on which at least I'm gathering today is the traditional unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their peoples. I also want to acknowledge that some of you will be joining us from both near and far, and I want to also acknowledge the traditional owners of those lands, past and present as well. My name is Joan Batorf. I'm a professor in the School of Nursing and director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention here at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus in Kelowna. We are delighted to welcome you to the eighth annual Okanagan Brace Aging Month. And it seems like it has not been a very fast eight years since we first uh, started this um, program. And we began it to raise awareness about positive aging. And as you will have noticed by our program, we've organized quite a number of educational opportunities and events during the month of March. And these events are really designed for everybody, young and old alike. And as you will notice, they focus on a wide variety of topics related to healthy aging and ways to improve the quality of life for seniors, for family caregivers, actually uh, for all of us and to inspire each and every one of us to embrace positive aging. You will notice on your screen that there's a closed captioning box and that can be moved to any location on your screen just by holding on the little box and moving it around. Or alternatively, if you find it a bit distracting, you can turn it off. At the bottom of your screen, there should be a live transcript button that you can use to turn off the captioning if you wish. We will have a chance for questions and comments. So I encourage you at any time during the presentation to jot your comments and questions into the chat box and uh, we'll read them out to our speaker and have a conversation uh, towards the end of our hour. So today's event for Embrace Aging is brought to you by the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention here at UBC Okanagan. And I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Heather Cook, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the UBC School of Nursing and has also been doing some teaching for us on our campus as well. She lives in our region, which is, makes it even better. Um, and I'm delighted to have her today talk about some of her research on staff relationships in long-term care homes and why they matter. And uh, we've heard a lot about long-term care over the last uh, year. And so um, I'm sure that we we still have lots of questions about what happens in long-term care and how we can keep everyone safe. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cook. Terrific. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Joan. And uh, I just want to acknowledge before we get started, just uh, our funders who helped make this research possible. So that would have been the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, and also um, WorkSafe BC. Now, Jaquetta, I know that we had everyone do a poll as they came in. Are you able to share the results of that on the screen? There we go. So we've got some of you who work in a care home, some of you who volunteer in a care home, we've got some family members on the line, and some folks who are just interested in the topic, which is uh, fantastic. So wonderful. Thanks. So oops, let me just, there we go, close that. And there we go. So I have to say, after um, working in this field for more than 25 years, I never thought I would see my field of research receive so much press. Long-term care has never been a particularly sexy topic, but it's one that's garnered much attention and rightfully so in the media over the course of the last year. So on the screen in front of you, there's a smattering of headlines from the army being called into care homes out east to gut-wrenching military reports to increased attention on the nature of for-profit homes and ongoing staffing shortages. Certainly over the past year, COVID has revealed the fault lines that exist in our long-term care homes across the country. 
the ongoing systemic and structural issues that beleaguer long-term care, staffing shortages, chronic under-resourcing, and residents with increasingly complex needs, uh, which Andre Picard does a great job highlighting in his recently released book, which is pictured uh, in the middle of the screen here, Neglected No More. So here in BC, 23,000 people live in long-term care homes, and their care is provided by slightly more than the same number of staff. And that's greater than the number of people that are served in acute care across the province. Um, but such care is provided over a much longer period of time than a typical hospital stay, for example. And the average length of stay in a care home is about 18 months. So as such, our long-term care homes are places where relationships flourish between staff and residents. And certainly if you ask staff about the best part of their job, they'll tell you that it's working with their residents. But if you ask them about the most challenging part of their job, quite frequently they'll tell you that it's working with their fellow staff. So relationships between staff are an essential part of this care environment. And I think it's important to remember that the research today that I'm gonna talk about was conducted prior to COVID-19, but it certainly illustrates why now more than ever, our workplace relationships among staff and long-term care homes really matter. So a little bit of background uh, as to how I came to be studying this. So about eight years ago, I was working on my PhD, doing research also in long-term care. And I had the unfortunate experience of witnessing an abusive episode. It was morning care. There were two care aides in the room um, and I was situated out of view unobtrusively behind the door. And the resident was really struggling to understand what was happening. One of the care aides, likely frustrated, lashed out and started yelling at the resident. Now it was an incredibly powerful experience um, not the least of which was due to the fact that immediately following the resident who had advanced dementia was able to share what that was like for her in the moment. But equally powerful was when I went to speak to the other carried in the room. And I explained that I was going to need to go ahead and report what I had seen. And her reply was, do you have to? Now this was a care aide who was kind and compassionate and caring and gentle with the residents. And I probed a little and said, what makes you say that? And she says, well, this other care aide, she knows a lot of people here and she's gonna make my life hell. So for this particular care aide, the fear of repercussion from her colleague overrode the safety of the residents in her care. And so when it came time for me to think about my next research project, I decided that I wanted to look a little more closely at these workplace relationships of care staff, and specifically around these concepts of incivility. And it turns out that while incivility has received lots of attention in our hospital settings with the nurses, it's received very little attention in our care homes. And now some of you may be aware, particularly given the press in the last year, that much of our hands-on care in care homes is provided by care aides who are um, primarily women. They're frequently from ethnic minorities. They have very low occupational status and we really pay them very little for the work that they do. So the conditions that have typically been associated with uncivil relationships in other settings, things like excessive workloads and limited resources, organizational change, low social support, high job demands, these are all things that describe the current context of long-term care. And these again are the same systemic and structural challenges that have received so much attention in the press over the last year and that have allowed COVID-19 to wreak havoc in so many of our care homes. Even pre-COVID, the long-term care sector has struggled with an aging workforce, an ongoing shortage of care aides, and retention and turnover issues. So all of this really highlights that need to attend to these issues of incivility, which has the potential to undermine those respectful, the collaborative, those effective working relationships that are so key to care provision, to staff safety, and to resident safety. 
So what do we mean when we're talking about incivility? What do we mean by uncivil relationships? Well, incivility is commonly described as a low intensity deviant act that violates these workplace norms that we have for respectful interactions amongst one another. And it's characterized by this ambiguous intent to harm. And that simply means that it's really hard to prove that someone intended to hurt you with that behavior. So incivility is considered one of the most pervasive forms of antisocial workplace behavior. And yet its subtlety makes it very difficult to detect. So compared with bullying or harassment, uncivil acts are much more likely to be passive, indirect as opposed to direct, and verbal as opposed to physical. So they don't necessarily rise to the same level as bullying or harassment, which in many jurisdictions is prohibited by law or organizational policy. So as we set out on the research, there were a couple of things that we wanted to know. We wanted to know to start with, what are the types of incivility to which carrieds are exposed in the course of their day-to-day -day relationships? How do their individual and organizational factors influence their experience of incivility? So that's things like age or gender or how long someone's worked at a, at a site. And then looking at our staffing hierarchies and all of those pieces, again, some of those issues we've seen before, workloads and those sorts of things. We wanted to know how Carried's working relationships were impacted by incivility. And then in turn, we wanted to know what impact at the end of the day does this have on care delivery? So to answer these questions, we spent time in two not-for-profit care homes. One was rural and one was urban. And within the homes, we focused on three units and each was home to approximately 25 to 30 residents and staffed with about three care aides um, who reported to one LPN during the day. And in the evening that would drop slightly and you'd have two care aides and one LPN. Now, of course, that's if you were fully staffed. Well, this made for a total of 46 participants. So that included the care aides, it included the LPNs who are often our team leaders in long-term care, admin staff and support staff, which included housekeepers. Because if you wanna know what's going on in a long-term care home, you just need to ask the housekeeper. They really are the eyes and the ears. Now the care aides, um, not surprisingly, were female, but they were mostly Caucasian and Canadian born. So their ethnicity doesn't necessarily reflect what we know about the care aid workforce here in British Columbia, but it does reflect the demographics of the area in the homes, um, the area in which the homes were situated. And to find out a little bit more, we conducted 33 interviews with those participants and then spent 100 hours um, observing kind of the daily care routines, hanging out at the nursing station, shadowing the care aides as they went about their, their shifts. So in terms of our findings, well, they really highlighted how the care aides encountered this incivility, this subtle, insidious, passive aggressive behaviors that have this ambiguous intent to harm on an almost daily basis. It's almost daily from someone somewhere, said one carried. An LPN who worked at multiple homes said, I've seen it happen everywhere at any of the homes. And it almost happens so frequently that I kind of just brush it off. But this reference to brushing it off suggests how over time, incivility can be this entrenched part of the workplace culture. So common examples included people gossiping or talking about others behind their back, forming cliques that included some but not others, um, ignoring people, particularly new staff or casuals uh, at report, which is a um, shift change, or not responding to requests for help, not saying hello at the start of the shift, sometimes uh, sabotage was involved. And by that, I simply mean that staff wouldn't pass along the key information that might be needed to perform a certain care task. There was blame and criticism. 
And sometimes the behaviors didn't remain in the workplace, but spilled out into the curate's personal lives. So we often think of home as this safe space where work doesn't intrude. But our 24-7 access to smartphones and social media platforms like Facebook means incivility can follow us home. And so cyber incivility is the term that's often used to refer to the posts on social media, like guess who didn't show up for work again, where no one is named, but all of an individual's colleagues know exactly who's being talked about. So here is a quote that came from one of our participants, and she was relaying her experience working in a Another setting where a male colleague had come in and plonked on the table in the break room a plate of bird seed. And he said, here, you're just a bunch of hens. Um, and so this hen-like behavior, gossiping or nitpicking, um, were seen by participants as inherently feminine traits that were part and parcel of working in a workplace that's dominated by women. But this suggests that such behavior may also be a reaction to the setting in which women find themselves. In a workplace where there's very little formal status, power or recognition that are very difficult to achieve, women then compete for power and status in other ways, through the use of squabbles, blame and criticism. Now the challenge with this discourse and attributing traits to simply women being women, is that it sanctions the incivility and it allows this bad behavior to continue unabated. So as I've mentioned, long-term care is a very gendered environment. The majority of the residents and the majority of the staff who care for them are women. And the gendered nature of the care homes contextualize the references made by almost all our participants as to how their workplace relationships made them feel like they were still in high school. The gossiping, the rumors, the cliques, the social exclusion, and the tit for tat behavior when someone did something that just pissed them off. So if something was amiss with a resident, they were missing their dentures or someone was unshaven, or there was something amiss in their room, so there was maybe some soiled towels left behind after some care had been done, Staff were very quick to blame it on another care aide. And while these behaviors likely reflect the culture of blame and criticism that exists um, in many of our care homes, they also left staff questioning the sincerity of their colleagues' motives and has potentially undermined this development of trust between staff. Now, staff at both our study sites were very consistent in terms of their use of the word clique. And this is where the care aides would gravitate towards those with whom they were friendly outside work. And we all do that. But at times this meant that others were excluded from laughter and inside jokes. And it was particularly noticeable when there was a new care aide working or orientating as she was just getting started or um, at shift change where we've got one shift coming on and the next shift leaving. Very subtle body positioning and language um, would convey which carries were either in the group or out of the group. And social exclusion at times was used as a means of punishment. So for coworkers who might repeatedly miss a shift uh, without calling in to explain why they were missing the shift. And then of course, the challenges, the structural challenges, meaning that often those staff weren't replaced, which meant that their teammates then worked short. So the next time that staff member came in, that staff member came in for a shift, they'd be given the cold shoulder by their colleagues. And so the care aides were frustrated with what they perceived as management inaction on this. Why is this still happening? And so they would seek to mete out their own form of justice. And exclusion was also used as a means of revenge. So as we'll see shortly, there's very much these notions of reciprocity embedded in our caring relationships. And so carries would say, well, she never helps us, so we're not going to help her. So the carries experiences with um, relational aggression, which is this concept 
that's been used extensively in researching bullying amongst teenage girls, but it's rarely been used uh, in workplaces. And it refers to these non-physical, manipulative, and exclusionary forms of social aggression that threaten friendships and relationships. And so it's really of little surprise that the Carries referred to their workplaces just like high school, a setting in which these types of behaviors predominate. Now, research suggests that women are much more socialized to express frustration and emotion in non-threatening ways. And say so they resort to these more manipulative means of resolving conflict and kind of jockeying for position. And women are much more likely to use relational aggression as their weapon of choice. So relational aggression flourishes in systems where there is greater visible order. Um, so think about some of the hierarchies uh, in long-term care. So we've got general managers who, if we do see men in long-term care, this is where they tend to be. We've then got directors of care underneath them who are typically women. Underneath them, we have the nurses, the RNs and the LPNs. They too are typically women. And then we have the carries who are typically women. So where there's this greatable, greater visible order, we, send to, we tend to see this invisible disorder occurring. And it's in this system that carries possess very little structural power. So feeling disempowered, feeling disenfranchised, there's a tendency for them to lash out at those who have less power. And so their workplace relations are really tied to these tensions and these struggles around the informal power that they hold. At the bottom of the power hierarchy, the carries resort to this aggression amongst themselves as a means of achieving that status and dominance. So there were three key ways that we identified how some of these power relationships between staff played out in terms of care delivery, and they primarily centered around the care aid's helping behaviors. So exposure to peer incivility created a reluctance to seek assistance from coworkers with whom care aides had had a previous altercation, who'd made it obvious that they didn't want to assist the care aid, or implied the care aid was incompetent because of their need for help to perform their work. So experiences such as this one described by Emily and other nonverbal cues displayed following requests for help. So things like huffing and puffing, and the eye rolling that would occur all conveyed a sense of being inconvenienced such that relatively early on in her position, Emily simply stopped asking her carries or her, um, her fellow carries, some of her fellow carries for help. And this reluctance to request help also stemmed from not wanting to be viewed as incompetent because incompetence, whether viewed um, as real or fabricated by unhelpful coworkers, was equated with powerlessness and was a real potent motivator amongst the carries. So in terms of receiving help, the carries were very cognizant of the behaviors that were valued by and would ensure help from their coworkers. So there's notions of worthiness and reciprocity really featured prominently uh, in their interviews. And so to be considered worthy of receiving help, a curate had to work independently and efficiently. We know that to work independently and efficiently is really the only way you're gonna try and get any of these tasks done. Um, in the course of your shift. But exposed to the structural factors that commonly contribute to increased workload. So things like those staffing shortages, being under-resourced, this increased resident complexity. The carries were very sensitive to the potential sources of power inequities and this need to maintain balance. So Courtney shared, you've got to play the game. You need to make sure that if you do something for somebody nice, that they're always going to do something back to you. Nice. And so there's a, a quote here on the screen that illustrates um, from Brooke how she says, you know, when I first started working here and I'd call for help, they'd be like, ah, sorry, you're just going to have to wait. 
And she says, well, how long do I have to wait when I've got a resident who's in a sling waiting, you know, a sling lift waiting to be transferred either onto the toilet or off the toilet or into bed. Um, whereas now she says, you know, they, um, they're like, oh, I'll be right there. And so she says, well, now they've seen that I'm helpful and I'm useful and I can do my job well. So by extending help to her coworkers and making herself useful, Brooke has proved herself a valued and competent member of the team who contributed to the unit workload and someone who would be considered worthy of assistance. And so power was then conferred to her by her longer tenured coworkers and her position in that power hierarchy then started to change. Now one carried astutely noted now, we are going to work short forever if we don't start treating the new staff with respect, because the new staff are going to turn in tears after one shift, and they're never going to come back. And we're going to work short every single day for as long as we can imagine. So the power relations that underpin the Carey's workplace relationships led some staff to resist help and other longer tenured carries to resist helping newer carries and dictated the extent to which a carried might provide care to a resident for whom another carried might be responsible. So carries often would work in teams um, or on a particular wing. And then if someone was off on a break, then they would assume responsibility for the resident on that wing while someone was on break. Now, there was repeated observations that we did on one particular wing where many of the residents, as I mentioned, they've got complex needs, were designated um, to have two people in the room to help them when there was a lift or a transfer involved. But one of the youngest carries on the wing resisted help and insisted that she could do the care for all of those residents without bringing in another staff member to help. Catherine, who is a slightly older and more experienced carried, well, she would say, well, I really need help with two residents, but the rest I can do by myself. While Emily, who was an older, more experienced carried, expected help with at least four of the 10 residents. Now, assistance was rarely offered to Emily and Catherine, and when they did request it, they commonly had to wait. So again, illustrative of where they fell in that workplace hierarchy. And Leah's reluctance to accept help as the newest member of the team suggests that she was aware of some of these undercurrents that were going on and that she was seeking acceptance by her colleagues by demonstrating this self-sufficiency and independence. So at times, staff felt bitter at having to answer calls while a coworker was on their break. And so this is a, a quote by Courtney here, who working with a care, um, care team member who she felt didn't answer the calls that came through. So they used phones uh, as a call bell system. So if a resident rings, it rings through to a phone on the, the carried's hip. And so when she says, I can feel my phone, she feels that it's ringing, but there was a unique uh, ringtone. So she knew that it wasn't her resident, one of her residents that was calling, but one of her teammates. And she said, you know, I, she needs to learn to answer her call bells. And so she would turn off the phone. But what that meant was that if her team member needed assistance, um, she wasn't able to get it because her, the, her colleague's phone was, was turned off. And so that potentially puts uh, the individual and the care team member at risk. So at times, as I said, when a coworker was on a break, um, or if, as illustrated here, a carried wasn't seen as pulling their weight, then um, the, the carried who was left on the unit um, would provide not as much care, not the detailed thorough care that maybe was required. And that potentially compromises resident safety and skin integrity. And as another carried noted, the residents don't get to choose which carried goes in on a particular shift or how the day is going. And so this carried said, you know, if your carried's feeling neglected by their teammates, they're not going to go into the residence room and be like, hi, how are you doing? They're going to be like, hi, 
And you know, she said, it just brings down that whole atmosphere. And Carrie certainly acknowledged that the residents heard and sensed the tensions that at times existed between staff, and that in turn, this could increase residents' anxiety. So our findings reveal the complexity of the workplace relationships and team functioning in long-term care. And they suggest that it, who is on shift warrants just as much attention as how many are on shift. And that quality isn't just about having quality people, but it's about quality relationships between those people. Um, there's a, a book that I've been working my way through called Big Potential by a fellow named Dr. Sean Aker. And he talks about how as teams, um, it's, it's the whole is greater than just the sum of its parts, right? That there are these team dynamics that occur and it's trying to find those team dynamics. And that's what makes for these quality relationships. So adding more staff, well, definitely that's something necessary to ensure um, we provide quality care. It's not necessarily a sufficient means of improving our care quality. So we really need to expand our discussion around staffing and quality beyond numbers to include a focus on the work environment and the care processes. And we need to pay closer attention to those workplace relationships because those relationships are key to the care aids and the resident well-being. So pitching in seeking assistance and reciprocating. These are all things that foster effective collegial relationships. And they lay the foundation for information exchange and problem solving around resident care. Now, while several care aides in our study initially sought to engage in those positive patterns, those refusals of assistance from their, their colleagues or lack of reciprocity meant that they gradually abandoned such behavior. But reciprocity is about giving and receiving in a manner that generates goodwill. But when you work within the context of staffing shortages, of under-resourcing, and this increased resident complexity, there are limits that get placed upon the carried's ability to reciprocate. And the carried's experiences illustrate that a positive work environment, cohesive, collaborative workplace relationships just can't be left to simply organically emerge. Rather, they require cultivation and support over the long term. And this is particularly salient when we think about the high turnover rates and the shortages within the sector and the part-time and casual status of much of the long-term care workforce. You know, how do we bring people together to work in this heavily team-oriented environment. And supervisors, so those are the LPNs, the nurses, and the unit managers are really integral in fostering an environment of civility, of mutual support, of trust, and reciprocity, and in turn, the achievement of better care outcomes. So having a regular presence on the unit means that they're aware of the team relations and they, they can identify, they can support, and they can expand those interactions that promote teamwork. But the LPNs, they don't typically receive management training as part of their schooling, and yet they're responsible for this very diverse group of workers. They're rarely offered professional development or mentorship around how to cultivate positive work environments and relationships. And so they too need increased training and support around this. So if I'm to leave you with one key take home message today, it's that our residents' quality of care is inextricably linked to care aid's quality of their work life. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this talk, this research was conducted pre-COVID. And so for the last year, care aides have been working long hours under extraordinary pressure and potentially even more short staffed than they were pre-pandemic. It wasn't unusual for me to um, enter into the home and to start an observation. And on the list on the board, they would have who was working which shift for the day. There would be one name on the board. 
which meant that they were then scrambling to try and fill those positions. And that was before COVID hit. So our carries have experienced considerable changes within their workplaces. We've got single site orders, which means that staff can only work at one site. They can't work at multiple sites, which is often what they did to be able to cobble enough money, put food on the table and a roof over their head. There's uh, limited visitors in our care homes, absence of support from families and families play a key role in our long-term care homes. There's been no staff appreciation or recognition events. All of this to mean that they're spending more time with their colleagues than they ever had before. And the workplace pressures are greater than they've ever been. And so I think it's important that we really do need to remember that our care aides are the hearts and the hands of our long-term care system. And we need to find a way to support their workplace relationships, to help them find that time to be calm, to be kind, to be safe, and to really shine as healthcare heroes. Whoops. So just to uh, uh, general call out, thank you to the members of our team. Uh, and uh, we had a wonderful community advisory committee that helped us with this research. So made up of um, folks from within the, the sectors that included representation from the unions, um, from care organizations, and uh, the wonderful artwork that you saw on the slides there by our graphic illustrator, Caitlin Bowman. Uh, my email and contact information is on the screen. If you need to reach out, I'm happy to connect. And there's a couple of articles that have come out of this work that were recently published, and they're open access, which means that anybody with an internet connection can access them. So feel free to, uh, to have a read of those. And so at this point, uh, I'd like to turn it over for questions. Great, thank you very much, uh, Heather, that was wonderful. Um, I encourage people to type in their questions or comments in the chat box, but maybe I'll start us off. Um, so your research was conducted in not-for-profit uh, long-term care. So I'm assuming that's private not-for-profit. Is that right? Or that's, that's, that's right. So, you know, maybe just, a, a, oh, sorry, I was going to no, say. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I, a, I just, a quick. A quick word about that, because I think, you know, it's not always obvious um, how we fund our, our long term care. So we have <clears throat> publicly funded, owned and operated care homes, and those are what we call they're owned and operated by the health authority. Mm -hmm. But then we have private homes, but those private homes are still publicly funded. So they still receive money from the health authority to provide care to their residents. And some of those private homes are not for profit and some of them are for profit. The idea being that if you've got not for profit, then any profit that does get made gets turned back over to resident care, whereas a private for profit, they're getting public monies, but whatever efficiencies they can achieve then go uh, into their shareholders pockets. Okay. Okay. So, sorry. No, that's very helpful. I just wanted to just be sure I had that right. And so that is, that is helpful. So was there a reason that you chose the not-for-profit private uh, long-term care settings to do this work in? Oh, great, great question. So we had established relationships with these sites. So when you're doing kind of the ethnographic work, which is the work that we do, um, often it's building on, on those connections. Part of the, the not-for-profit was to sort of say, well, these are sites that typically the not-for-profit sites have better quality of care outcomes than private for-profit sites. So what do the relationships look like in those homes that presumably are doing fairly well with some of these care outcomes? And uh, so that was kind of part of the reason behind that decision. And, and you know, these are homes that um, are good homes, but struggling with some of these workplace issues within their within the homes. And similarly, um, we went with unionized sites um, because typically unionized sites tend to pay their staff more. So we kind of wanted to take away some of those other issues mm -hmm. to be able to do a bit of a deeper dive into the workplace relationships. Yeah. Now you have me a little worried. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, assuming that these are these sites, um, 
the not-for-profit long-term care homes, we might expect to give the highest quality of care. Mm -hmm. And we're still seeing these issues that around staff relationships that influence care uh, and might undermine that quality of care that people are receiving. So I can't help but think if I was a family member looking for a place for my family member to move them into long-term care, how would I be able to assess this? Like, how would I know how the staff are getting along now knowing from your research how important this is to the care they receive? Yeah, well, that's even nice if they're in a care home right now. How yeah. would I get a sense of that uh, yeah. as a family member? Excellent question. So when we're not in COVID, I mean, obviously everything is compounded with COVID at the moment, but mm -hmm. assuming, you know, we get to this point where our care homes open up and I, you know, hopefully uh, Dr. Bonnie is going to allow that to happen in the not so distant future. Um, and you're looking for a place and you, you're able to go in and take a tour, which absolutely, if you're looking um, for a placement for a family member, you know, go in and spend some time, have a tour, take a tour and get a sense as you are having the tour of the, the home. What do the, you know, the staff have smiles on their face? Are they bantering between each other? Do they look tense? You know, what are kind of some of the things that you might observe as you're, you're walking around the home? And you can also ask the, the individual giving your tour, tell me like, how does staff get, get along here? How long have they been here? That's often a, a key one. So um, what's interesting is the staff at our study sites had been at their sites on average about five years. So they'd all worked at their sites for a relatively stable period of time. But if you have a home that's a bit like a revolving door, you know, and you ask that question around how many, you know, how long have your staff been here? If you've got staff who are leaving in quick succession, often that's a sign that there's some, some challenges that they're experiencing with their staffing and their relationships. Yeah, that's interesting. And I hadn't really thought about, um, you know, asking about, about how staff would get along with one another as you, as you think about a long-term care setting. It, I often think about, okay, how many staff do you have on at a particular yes. shift, right? I mean, that's yep. what we would logically think about and ask about mm -hmm. as opposed to that, how the people are getting along. So I think it's interesting. And even... It is interesting that even though staff had been in, in these organizations five years, there were still these subtle things going on that were influencing the way that they work and the care that they provided. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so interesting. Well, interesting is an overused word. My husband often says, well, interesting to you, maybe. But, <laughs> you know, we um, sat in on what's called the, the occupational... Um, health and safety committee meetings. So the joint occupational health and safety. So you've got representatives from the union and you've got management there. And we all sit around the table and, and talk about, you know, work, workplace safety issues. And those typically focused on physical safety. So it'd be like, oh, we need, there's a tripping hazard in so-and-so's room, yeah. or it's getting a bit cluttered in Mrs. Smith's room and we need to address that. So it was, or, you know, we're in the kitchen and we need a mat because we're standing for a long time and our back is getting sore. Those are the sorts of things that got talked about. And yet that occupational health and safety committee is just an ideal place to start talking about what do our relationships look like among staff? So we know that, you know, this, this research has started to show like workplace relationships are important and yet we spend so little time on thinking about how we might facilitate those within our homes. Right. Yeah. I see there's a question from Paula. It's a great question. From your perspective, what would be the most important skill a new HCA, healthcare assistant, I think that means, yeah. uh, would bring into the team work in long-term care? Great question. Oh, that's a fantastic question, Paula. Oh, um, and that's really the $64,000 question, isn't it? <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think that ability to work as a team, right? So I think we sometimes think that um, someone who is independent and um, we just, we need the job to be done, off they go and do it. But 
And we live and work in relationship and long-term care. And so that ability to really, um, to have insight and understanding and empathy around what your team members are going through, what the residents are experiencing. So, you know, being a, a team player, um, having empathy. And, you know, I often think that like care, we often talk about people being a natural fit, right? That, oh, they're just naturally good at this. But I often sort of hesitate a little bit of that because the implication is that then there are people who are not good and, and are unnatural at it. And yet I think in part, it's how we work with our staff. So yes, there might be some traits that we would look for, you know, being a team player, being empathic, obviously, you know, being kind and caring, but you know, most people who walk through those doors are going to be those types of individuals. So it's about how do we be, um, how are we team players? And I think um, I was attending a conference in January, a virtual conference, and it actually came out of Silicon Valley and it was all around workplace culture because the startups, all of those tech startups spend a lot of time and effort trying to figure out how to get the best out of their teams because it has implications for their profit making and the, the bottom line. And they, um, Google has done some really great work around trying to figure out who the best people are for the team. And so they would take all these bright stars and they would put them together on a team, but it didn't actually necessarily translate into a wonderfully functioning team, that there's more at play in terms of those team dynamics. So really being an individual who's gonna really recognize part of being that team, I think. And I, you know, that was a very long-winded answer to Paula's question, but uh, that helps. Yes, thank you. And so following up on that, you know, I'm wondering how a manager mm -hmm. um, can support a new, the introduction of a new healthcare aide or nursing assistant into the workplace to, I don't know, help smooth this process. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, another, another great question. And ideally, in a perfect world, we would have, we would pair that individual with an experienced care aide who had the, you know, who was a team player, who had all of those characteristics um, that was able to model that. Like, here's, here's how we work together yeah. and to kind of take her under her wing and have that. The reality is that in our care homes today, we might um, kind of say, okay, who, who's willing to take on? Like, and we saw this happen as part of our research, where you'd have a new care aide and it wouldn't have been decided ahead of time who that care aide was going to shadow. And I, I, one of the moments in the study that was one of those really awkward moments was when this new care aide came out and the care aide said, well, I don't need her, you take her. And the other care aide said, I don't need her, you take her. And the other one said, well, no, you have more difficult residents, you, you take her. And this poor woman just kind of stood in the background and I think both she and I wanted the ground to open up beneath us because it was this really awkward moment. Um, I know one of the sites used to actually pay a bit of a differential to their staff when they were um, mentoring and orientating a new staff member. So, you know, that gives, uh, that gives recognition or finding some way to recognize that the staff who's mentoring that has actually been chosen because they're a positive, they're a really mm -hmm. great member of the team, as mm -hmm. opposed to kind of what I witnessed where they just were like, oh, this is one more. I mean, for them, it was like, I don't have time mm -hmm. to show someone the ropes. This is as a sort of like shackle around my leg for the next three days. Yeah. Um, so kind of shifting how we do that. So I think the, the mentoring part is key. And, you know, unfortunately, again, the reality, often staff would start out orientating and then someone would call in sick and they'd be like, well, we need you to go work on that wing over there and um, have at her. And I just, you know, having a background in long-term care, it's, it's like, wow, um, I can't imagine being on my second shift and all of a sudden being let loose on these residents. I have no idea who these residents are 
what their needs are, how they do things, all of those little intangibles that all of the other staff know that really make it such a positive experience for the residents. So, yeah, yeah. so yes, I think that mentoring part is key, but thinking about how we do that and really making a conscientious effort to do that. Yeah, yeah, very important. Yeah. Michelle's got a great question here too. Do you see a need and or opportunity for the LPN and RN to receive more training in their courses and practicums to gain more leadership management skills to support Kate? Uh, care aids and the quality of care, um, either during their degree as well as opportunities for uh, more education while they're in the field. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think this is, this is really key. So again, sort of thinking back to business, we would never hire someone fresh out of school, put them in charge of a team of 10, 15 individuals, um, let them loose without any kind of mentorship or support or checking in with them. Yeah, we do that every single day in long-term care. We have freshly graduated um, nurses who come in and, you know, then they're met with folks who might be a little resistance because here's a newbie. Well, I've got 25 years of working in the field. I don't need you to tell me how to do my job. Um, and so, you know, again, those, those power struggles. So absolutely giving those LPNs and the RNs, I think the RNs might I think probably spend a little more time in their program talking about the relational care, but it's the, the RNs aren't the ones that are leading the teams in long-term care these days. It falls on the shoulders of the LPNs. So really, um, how do you how do you work in teams? How do you how do you have courageous conversations? So a couple of the LPNs in our study. Um, you know, one of them had said, well, I, I've seen this behavior occur, but it wasn't my team member. And I just, uh, I just didn't really want to get into it. Um, and so, you know, she didn't have the skills to have those courageous conversations and to, to reach out to her teammates. But when we let those things slide, this is how these toxic environments then start to, to unfold. And I think as well, giving, giving support once they start. So you've got a newbie um, LPN who starts and checking in with them. Again, pairing them with a more experienced LPN who meets with them um, regularly. I've got a good friend who's a teacher and she's mentoring three new um, teachers this year who've just started at the school and they meet once a month and you know what are the challenges how can I support you so again we do that in education how do we port that over into healthcare, right and and support them but again it comes back to our resourcing right the funds the money the time Yes, and hopefully with, uh, with what we've learned during COVID, the resourcing in long-term care will change for the better. Um, yep. And um, I think it's very clear it needs to, so maybe we can be confident about that. Yeah. Um, I guess my uh, other question that comes to mind, and in some ways it follows the questions that have been posed by people in our audience is, and I'm not sure about this because I'm not familiar with long-term care, uh, accreditation or checks or whatever you want to call that, but are there criteria that long-term care have to meet regardless if they're private, not-for-profit or public or whatever that would help address this? Like, does anyone check? <laughs> yes. So, so uh, great, great question. So we have the adult care regulations. So we have some very stringent regulations that outline what has to be done in long-term care. We have very little around staffing. So mm -hmm. nothing, we actually don't have anything. It, it says something along the lines of you need sufficient staff to ensure um, resident needs are met, right? It's very vague, generic language. Um, people are, you know, hesitant to put in um, any kind of prescriptive language around that. So that's one of our challenges around uh, the number of staff we have on. Obviously, there's uh, not much around um, the uh, quality of those workplace relationships. We have a lot around, you know, the physical environment, the hallway needs to be this wide, the, the fridge needs to be at this temperature. So when we have um, the licensing officers who come in and do the checks, so they're the ones that are checking to see whether there's compliance with those regulations. Often it's things like, 
Is the dishwasher functioning at the right temperature? Is the fridge, you know, mm -hmm. keeping food at the right temperature? Um, have the medication administration records been signed off by everybody that has, you know, given the medication, which are all important things. But are they essential to what we consider quality of care or quality of life? Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, yes, I would like to know that my parent or my spouse um, or even, you know, my adult child um, has had three meals a day and access to snacks and that we're not giving them spoiled food. But I want those, like, if that's all it comes down to at the end of my life, I, I, what about my quality of life? What about mm -hmm. my um, engagement? What do my relationships look like with the staff? What are all of these other pieces that contribute to our quality of life, engagement and purpose and all of that? Um, and those aren't things that are captured in no. our regulations. And so sometimes there's a call for, and I, you know, it's one of the things that's come out of the pandemic is, well, we need more regulations or more checks and balances, but we need to ensure that those checks and balances are about the right things because we yeah. don't need any more paperwork around yeah. what the temperature of the fridge is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's other things that we could be focused on, so. Elmi has a question here. It's a good question too. You talk about the stress of the workplace and feelings of lack of control felt by staff. Have you thought about ways to provide a pressure relief valve for workers in the workplace in some way, other than taking this out on other staff. Mm -hmm. So like circuit breaker. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, we often say, I mean, it's the, the thing they tell us on the plane, um, put your own oxygen mask on before you turn to the person beside you. Right. So what are some of the things that we can do to make sure we're taking care of our, our own health? And again, those are always easier said than done. So, you know, having someone, you know, in the organization, you know, who's checking in, who's, you know, how, how is the, what is the mental health like? You know, what's the pulse like in our home at the moment? And what are some things that we can do to help our staff? Maybe we're doing yoga on a lunch break or, you know, um, you know, ways to just, yes, have that, that circuit breaker, um, just that, uh, that awareness. I think one of the things, um, certainly that, um, we noticed during the research, um, I talked about shift change. So people come in, the new shifts coming on, the old ones leaving. And as the, the shift starts, there's a check-in and that check-in typically is around <coughs> kind of the physical care tasks that are required for the shift ahead, right? Or who's got an appointment or who's got this. And if we just maybe took a couple of minutes at the start to check in with each other, to be like, how is everyone doing today? And I know, Joan, <clears throat> I'm thinking of our staff meetings um, at mm -hmm. UBCO, right? Where you have that moment, that mindfulness moment, and mindfulness is becoming really big. You know, taking that moment um, to just connect with the staff. And that's that opportunity for someone to say, you know what? I had a really terrible night's sleep last night. My toddler is up multiple times in the night. I am not feeling 100% today. And so that's the opportunity for the others to be like, okay, we know that, you know, Jenny's not at her best today. So, you know, if she leaves those towels in a room or if there's a resident that's gone unshaven, like, hey, we're just going to step up and support her in that, right? Because all of us come to work. Some of us come with our baggage neatly tucked up, you know, in a small purse under our arm. And others, you know, come with a big wheelie suitcase behind, yeah. right? And that's the reality. And so how do we help people work through that and build that environment of, of trust? But I think, you know, I'm not sure there's any work that's been done around mindfulness that would be interesting to do. Yeah. with staff and long-term care and certainly, and what are the interventions to kind of support that wellness um, of our staff? So. We might have time for one last question here. It's from Grace. Uh, how do we get management in long-term care facilities to finally see the need for giving their LPNs trainers to be team leaders for integrated care and staff working together? Oh, that's a great question. Well, um, I did speak at the BC Healthcare Leaders Conference hey. with a group of managers. So we, you know, we try and speak to managers when we can. And we've got a, um, a workshop coming up through uh, Safe Care BC um, for managers around incivility and, and kind of helping them work through some of those, those strategies. Um, you know, that's, I, I don't have 
a quick answer for that. I mean, um, ultimately at the end of the day, I mean, taking this, you know, taking this back to, to managers and saying, this is what's at stake when your staff don't work well together and that, you know, folks need, folks need support. And I mean, in the same way that managers would want support, right? We can't expect managers to do their job. I wouldn't want their job for love nor money. Um, yeah. They're in a, a, a difficult place as well. They require support. So kind of having some introspection around, well, surely my other staff are going to need that support as well. Great. I guess we can all do our job to try and advocate for this, yes. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So yeah. I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But this has been a fabulous conversation. And it's been wonderful to hear about your research, Dr. Cook. And uh, it's so important um, in uh, as we move forward to really improve long term care for everybody. And so I do want to thank you for joining us and sharing your research today. And also to thank everyone who joined us and for your questions and comments. Um, it was a fabulous presentation, as you'll see in our comments. And Elmi also <laughs> says a uh, great presentation, and I totally agree. So I hope um, people who joined us have a chance to uh, join some of our future uh, upcoming uh, events in Embrace Aging. Have a look at the calendar if you haven't already. And we'll look forward to seeing you at a future uh, event. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, and bye.